Hello and welcome to episode 7 of It's Murder Up North, the podcast that looks at crimes that occur in the north of England. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Before I head to the episode, I just want to tell you about another fantastic podcast I definitely think you should check out. Eileen and Fern are the hosts of Crime Lapse. It is a well-researched, well-told podcast that will bring a tear to your eye. And the girls who host it are lovely. I definitely recommend you go and check it out wherever you get your podcast fix. Now, let's head to the episode. Today's episode starts 10,500 miles away from the cold, wintry north of England, in the town of Cooma, which lies roughly 72 miles away from Canberra, in New South Wales, Australia, with a population of 6,700. The town is famed as the gateway to the Snowy Mountains at the highest peaks in Australia. It was here that Martin Brown had moved from the UK with his family in 1993. Martin originally came from the north of England. After moving to Surrey, he met his future wife, Andrea, while on a night out in London. After they married and had started a family together, the couple chose to move to Andrea's native Australia with their two boys, Richard and Alex, to start a new life together. Andrea got a job as a primary school teacher and Martin started his own company working as a painter and decorator a trade he had learnt from his father. The family adjusted to life in the small town, and they became much-loved members of the community. They were just another normal, unremarkable family. That was until May 2006, when a knock at the door would bring the family's world crashing down. Another man whose life was changed by a knock at the door was Keith Slater. It was August bank holiday weekend, Keith and his wife, Carol, were spending a quiet night relaxing at home. Carol had a stressful day at work and Keith had been conducting driving lessons all day. So it was nice for them to just relax on the sofa watching TV. They had the evening to themselves, as their children had gone to stay at their grandmother's house for the weekend. The couple went to bed at about 11pm and had soon drifted off to sleep. At about midnight on August the 26th, 1988, there was a loud knocking at the front door that woke the couple. Carol drowsily stumbled to the window, her sleepy eyes peered through a small gap in the curtains. In the darkness, she could just make out the shadowy figure of a man clad in black. It looks like the police, she stated. The man hammered on the door again. Concerned that something had happened to their children, Keith quickly dressed and hurried downstairs. When he opened the door, the man spoke in a deep local accent. Are you Keith Slater? When Keith confirmed this, the man lunged at him, pushing the powerful rugby player to the ground. Hearing the commotion in the hallway, Carol raced downstairs to find the man pinning her husband to the floor. Keith fought his attacker and, with Carol's assistance, they were able to force him back outside before Keith collapsed on the garden path. His wife fell at his side and she looked up. Her eyes met the attacker's. He had stopped and was just staring at her with a large, empty gaze. Carol screamed and the assailant fled. She shouted for help as she cradled her wounded husband in her arms his blood soaking into her clothing. She continued to shout, Don't let him die! Don't let him die! Neighbours came to her aid. They carried the injured man into the living room, where he died from a stab wound to the neck that had severed his garotted artery. Eighteen years later, on the other side of the world, Martin Brown received a knock at the door. Upon opening it, he was confronted by two police officers. When they entered the premises, the two men revealed the purpose of their visit. Martin Brown was under arrest for the murder of Keith Slater. 
he was taken into an interview room at the police station where he was confronted by a detective with a very distinctive accent that Martin Brown recognised instantly. The detective was from Humberside Police. The news came as a shock to the close-knit community of Cooma, a town where everyone knew each other and had welcomed Martin and his family into their lives. How could this hard-working, mild-mannered man be responsible for murder? And why had he murdered Keith Slater? Keith Slater was 35 years old. He lived in Hessel, a town that sits on the Humber estuary, in the shadow of the magnificent Humber Bridge. The town is just on the outskirts of Hull, in East Yorkshire. He was a well-known figure in the area. He worked as a driving instructor and would often be seen on the streets of the town with his pupils. He was a friendly person, happy to wave and pass the time of day with you. His great love was playing rugby. He played for the local club and was fondly known as Slats. Keith would spend time down at the clubhouse, drinking, socialising and playing the sport he loved. Everyone who knew him at the club have fond memories of the wonderful, hard-working, fun-loving man he was. Nothing was too much trouble for Keith. If you needed help, Slats would be there. He was also devoted father and husband. They would take family trips away and would regularly visit a local beauty spot known as Little Switzerland, where we would teach the kids how to fish. They would play and spend quality time together. Keith was a popular and well-loved member of the community, with no known enemies. So the police investigation started by looking into Keith's past. They learned that Keith had been seen on several occasions with a woman in the National Club in Hull. She was described as being petite, blonde and very beautiful. She was often smartly dressed, wore lots of gold jewellery and had been known to have a briefcase with her. While police tried to track down this mystery woman, they looked into Keith and Carol's relationship. To the outside world, they appeared like a happily married couple, but the police knew that appearances can be deceiving. Had the marriage been in trouble? Was the mystery woman Keith's lover? After six weeks, the investigation stalled. With no new leads, the police turned to the public for help. They made an appeal on the BBC's Crime Watch UK, in which they reconstructed the events of August the 26th, 1988. This appeal led to a man called William Berry walking into a police station 200 miles away from Hull. The information provided the police with a new line of inquiry. William Berry told the police he was aware of a man called Joe Henry. It turned out that there had been problems in Keith and Carol's marriage. A year earlier, an affair had almost torn the couple apart. But it was Carol who had been unfaithful. She had been working at a care home where she met Joe Henry. Their relationship quickly progressed from co-workers to lovers. When Keith learned of his wife's betrayal, he was devastated. And after five months, Carol ended the affair, despite Joe's pleas to leave Keith and be with him instead. Had Joe, heartbroken and filled with anger, sought revenge on Keith? Did he hope that by killing his love rival, Carol would come back to him? Or did the attack have nothing to do with Carol's affair? Had it been a jealous partner of the mystery woman who had attacked Keith? After all, Carol was able to get a good look at the perpetrator and surely, if it had been Joe, she would have recognised him. The police did investigate Henry. They discovered that at the time of the murder he was living and working in Surrey and he had a solid alibi. Police also identified and eliminated Keith's mystery woman from the inquiry. Nothing was stated about who she was. Maybe she was just a friend or a business associate. To me, she sounded like she could have been a solicitor. Perhaps Keith was consulting her about his relationship. 
potentially considering divorcing Carol after the affair. Of course, this is just speculation and whatever the reason for her meetings with Keith, the police clearly didn't see it as as an important piece to the case. Joe Henry was another dead end. His alibi was cast iron. The investigation never found a murder weapon and they could not find any motive for the callous attack. The only clues they had was the description of the attacker. He was described as a stout man in his mid-twenties with wild, starey eyes. The only other clues were a matchbox and a bloodstained tissue. With so little to go on, the case went cold. So how did police end up on the other side of the world arresting Martin Brown? Keith Slater's case was reviewed in 2000 and all the information was scrutinised. Naturally, Joe Henry had always been a prime suspect. He had a motive, but his alibi had ruled him out. But when William Berry had told the police about Joe Henry, he also mentioned that Henry was friends with two brothers, one of whom was Martin Brown. Slowly the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Joe Henry was described as a fantasist. He had also been heard referring to Carol Slater as his gypsy princess. Joe Henry had shown an interest in the occult, something he had in common with the Brown brothers. William Berry had rented a property out to Patrick and Martin Brown, and Joe Henry was a frequent visitor. The landlord found the three men to be quite odd, and some of the conversations he had with them were unnerving. Witnesses claimed that the trio were often seen in woodlands near their Surrey home, performing occult rituals. Martin Brown in particular seemed to show a keen interest in all things spiritual and supernatural. During their investigation, they learned that he was especially drawn to numerology. Numerology is any belief in the divine or mystical relationship between a number and one or more coinciding events. While the investigators reviewed all the evidence available, they got a big break from the smallest of clues. It was something that didn't seem significant in the original investigation. On the matchbox, numbers had been written. They seemed random and unimportant. But when linked to numerology, it led them straight to Martin Brown. The numbers written on the matchbox were the Slater's house number, number 32, 26th of the 8th, 1988, the date of the murder, and more crucially, the 18th of the 2nd, 1964, which just happened to be Martin Brown's birthday. But of course, this was not enough to build the case against him. They needed to prove without doubt that he was the killer. The police looked at Martin's movements at the time of the murder. On August the 16th, 1988, a man stopped by the Hessel Rugby Club, where Keith Slater was a member. He asked if Keith was around, and when he was advised that he wasn't, the man left. Police were able to prove that Brian had travelled to Hull from London that day but he claimed he had been at a hospital appointment and didn't get to Hull until half past four. However, they were able to show he had arrived two hours earlier, so it's quite possible that it was him that was making the inquiries at the rugby club. It was also found that Martin had ventured to Hull on the 26th of August 1988. This was the day of the murder, and tallied with the numbers written on the matchbox, During the original investigation, Martin Brown claimed he had been in London that day, apparently purchasing cannabis for his brother. He claimed he ended up sleeping rough in a London park. This was quickly disproved by the evidence of the bus tickets. It also transpired that shortly after the murder, Martin Brown actually confessed to his mother. He told her he had committed the crime. She went to the police they were unable to proceed as the confession was deemed inadmissible. So Martin Brown had been on the police radar all along. They just had no way of bringing a conviction against him. 
The police in 2000 were aware that Martin now lived in Australia and there was no way they would be able to bring him back to the UK without evidence which would prove conclusively that Martin Brown had killed Keith Slater. Witness descriptions of the assailant closely matched Brown's appearance and police were able to trace the killer's movements through the streets of Hessel. That is how they found the bloodstained tissue. The tissue had spent many years in storage and had degraded over time. What police wanted to use at all was not readily available to them in 1988. They wanted to see if they could find any trace of DNA. Testing the blood on the tissue, they were able to confirm it belonged to Keith Slater. However, the tissue had become so fragile it was difficult to get any further samples. After four attempts and two years, they decided to use a different technique, known as twitch DNA, which didn't rely on as many markers, still pinpoint the presence of DNA on any item a person came in contact with. This led to the breakthrough they needed, and with the help of Nigel Brown, Martin's dad, the police were able to create a familial match. Quickly, each member of the Brown family was eliminated until only one remained. Martin Brown. Finally, the police had evidence to bring charges against their suspect. They actually called him, advising him that his DNA had been found. He was asked to fly back to the UK to answer some questions. Hello there, is that Martin? <coughs> Martin, it's the S.O. Bell from, uh, from Humberside. Um, we're reinvestigating the key to the murder. The reason we're reinvestigating the murder is that we have obtained a DNA profile um, which we are trying to find the source. And I've got to ask you whether you uh, consent to provide a DNA sample. This is a uh, Martin's refusal to assist in the investigation led the police to begin the extradition process against him. And that's how they ended up sitting in an interview room on the other side of the world facing Martin Brown. He had been living in a new town with his new life. I bet he thought he had got away with murder. But finally, his past had caught up with him. Martin Brown was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Keith Slater. But why had he killed Keith Slater? The two men had never met. In fact, Martin had to ask directions just to find Slater's house that night. During the trial, witnesses testified regarding Martin's belief in the occult. They claimed that the trio had made several references to an evil spirit called Slater. William Berry recalled a conversation in which his tenants advised him that there would be no more strange occurrences at the rental property, as Slater was now dead. At the time, the landlord just thought Martin and his flatmates, Joe Henry and Patrick Brown, were just odd individuals, and he didn't think anything of the comment. It was only when he saw the Crime Watch appeal that he connected the dots. It was alleged that Joe Henry had put the idea in his friends' minds that Keith Slater was an evil spirit. He had told them about his affair and how Keith had forced Carol to end it. He alleged that Carol was deeply unhappy and that Keith mistreated her. This was never proven. Had these conversations led to Martin killing Keith? Only the free men know the truth. After going to prison, Martin Brown confessed to being the one responsible for murdering Keith Slater. He also claimed that he did not act alone, and he implied that Joe Henry had helped him plan the attack. He claimed that Joe also provided him with the murder weapon. 
Although police strongly believe this allegation to be true, they have no way of proving it, other than Brown's testimony, and that is not enough to bring about a conviction. So Joe Henry is a free man, innocent until proven guilty. I'd be interested to know why you think Brown killed Slater. Did he truly believe that this man he did not know was an evil spirit he needed to destroy? Or did Joe Henry orchestrate the whole thing? I am sure police looked into Carol's involvement in the murder. Had she been complicit? Was it a plot to get rid of her husband so she could be with her lover? We've heard that story so many times. However, something inside me says I don't think she had anything to do with his death. And the police have also come to the same conclusion. Remember, Joe Henry was described as a fantasist. And perhaps Brown was just a dutiful follower who began to believe Joe's fantasies and they became entangled in his own beliefs. Apart from the question of why he killed Slater, this could be the conspiracy theorist in me, but I also wonder how a man who found it hard to find employment and had been doing odd jobs was able to relocate to Australia. Perhaps when he met Andrea, she had financial means to allow them to move. Or did someone provide him with money to leave the country? If the police believe others are involved, maybe they have wondered this too. What do you think? Thank you for joining me on this trip from Yorkshire to Australia. It was definitely a case full of twists and turns. It's one of those cases that the more you dig, the stranger the story becomes. This murder shocked two close-knit communities on opposite sides of the world and destroyed two families. What Martin Brown's wife, Andrea, was oblivious to her husband's dark past. She didn't know that she'd been living with a murderer. I always wonder how you can cope with a revelation like that. It also destroyed the family of Keith Slater. His young children had their father taken from them that night in a vile and senseless act. And Carol Slater lost her husband, to whom she had decided she wanted to be with, despite rough patching their marriage. Many cases, once they go cold, are never solved. It took 19 years for Keith Slater's murderer to be brought to justice. The police had the pieces, they just didn't have the tools. It sounds a bit like trying to build flat pack furniture, to be fair. In the last few years, power of DNA is definitely proving to be an incredible development that has helped bring closure to so many families. I hope you've enjoyed episode 7 of It's Murder Up North. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the episode. So please leave a review wherever you listen. I am currently working on a special idea for a future episode. If you live or have ever lived in Manchester, I would love to hear from you to let me know what you love about the city. Join me next week for another episode of It's Murder Up North. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows 